great. Everyone wants to do that, don't they? Every, everyone wants to hurtle along floating off the ground like that. There's some really nasty skeletons coming up as well. You've seen the burnt skeletons of those parents. Come on! Graphic, isn't it? Tour buses and fans now search out the obscure locations that inspired the look of Star Wars. This is Ajim. It's a sponge fishing town. But 20 years ago, this was Moss Eisley. Luke Skywalker's land speeder cruises right through here, past these ruins, behind me to that building, which was the cantina where they hire Han Solo, their pilot. Now, in 1976, you've got a false entrance built out there. There's a dewback tethered off to the side. A few drunk Jawas sacked out in front of that doorway. But this was the place. Everything in Star Wars is based on something here on Earth. It's a, it's a root of a design or an idea or a culture or an um, artifact that exists already. Uh, we have changed it, twisted it, moved it, shown it in a different light, if you would just uh, put it with code, a different background, taken it out of it its context, done everything we could to make it unusual. But it has a very familiar and strong ethnic base. George spelled out some very specific time periods that we should look at. One was going back to the 20s and 30s for sort of the uh, Art Nouveau movement and the Art Deco movement. Um, the other one was to go back to African art, which hasn't really been explored that well in film. Check it out, Corporal. We'll cover you. Roger, Roger. Normally when you think of science fiction, you try to project ahead and you try to think, oh, you know, 2050 or whatever, and you try to come up with some really far out designs. And that's where the danger lies. Instead, George went back in history to design the future. This is the Ksar of Mednin, a traditional Berber design of a type seen throughout southern Tunisia. Created as grain silos, each of these individual units, or gorfas, is a storage chamber. The extraordinary aesthetic of the Berber Ksar offered an exotic and yet recognizably humble setting for the slave quarters, which are home to young Anakin Skywalker. It's in this street that Anakin bids goodbye to his mother as he leaves with the Jedi Knight, Qui-Gon Jinn. Welcome to the Episode 1 Art Department. This is where it all starts in terms of design. On this wall, you can see um, this is sort of George's first opportunity to see a lot of his written words implemented into a design. And what we try here is to try to, you know, come up with something that George likes. And you can see here, this is one of the early sketches for the attack tank. <laughs> One well, of the next stages is to actually implement them and combine them into a production painting. And in here, you can see this is the finished version of the attack tank. And the main purpose of the production paintings is to try to capture the, the mood and the drama of, the, uh, of that moment. And hopefully, by picking out the key moments, it'll be enough to convey to the crew what the film is all about. Um, one of the other problems that we do that, that we try to solve is once the designs are finished is we normally try to build them as sort of hard surface maquettes or as sculpted maquettes. It's wonderful because once we get to this stage, George can look at it, see if it's working for him or not, and then if not, we go back and refine it and then build another maquette. Uh, another stage that we do is once we get the designs drawn and approved is we do um, storyboards, which are these here. And this is, again, really helpful because it starts to put in sequential order the drama and the, and the flow of the film. Um, finally, once all the designs are kind of approved, George likes it, what I try to do then is to build some full-size cardboard cutouts. And these are over here. And what these are helpful for is it, it tells us very quickly if something is working or not cinematically. Um, this will tell George if the droid is tall enough and if it's menacing enough or if it's too small and not menacing enough. Because these films are, are again, so complex in terms of their special effects, um, what we wanted to do was not just have traditional storyboards. We wanted to have moving, real animatics. We actually wanted to have the film done before we actually started shooting. He would sketch out a scene, 
Then we'd have storyboard artists draw it up, and then we'd give it to our animatic designers, and they would actually turn it into little pieces of film. Then we would take a look at it, he'd rewrite the scene, then give us three or four more shots to do, and then slowly, layer by layer, we would create this storyboard that was moving. You were able to see the scene before you shot it and see yourself as a kind of a computerized stick figure and where you had to walk and where the camera angles would be. And, and I found that a great help, you know. You hear that? Yeah. That is the sound of a thousand terrible things heading this way. If they find us, they will crush us, grind us into tiny pieces and blast us into oblivion. Ah. Your support is well seen. This way, hurry! One of the first problems that um, we had to solve in tackling all the designs for episode one was the main character of Jar Jar. And it was a hard problem because Jar Jar needed to carry a lot of the film. And, and George stressed that, you know, you have to like this character. And this is where um, part of the problem of creating digital character comes in, in that we have the danger if we execute it too well that it looks like a guy in a costume. Creatures are an integral part of the Star Wars universe. And I wanted to have creatures that weren't people in suits that could act. I've always wanted that. And so I've been pushing the technology to be able to achieve that. So Jar Jar was sitting there waiting to happen as soon as I could, you know, we got to Jurassic Park. And I said, aha, now we're on our way. Now I can do this. Hey, Jar Jar, huh? keep away from those energy binders. If your hand gets caught in the beam, it's going to go numb for hours. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jar Jar is the first fully animated digital character in a live action movie. The actor Ahmed Best provides Jar Jar's voice and also stood in for him on set. You're thinking, you said people gonna die? I don't know. Gungans get pasted too, eh? I hope not. By shooting two or three takes, uh, with Ahmed there and shooting another two or three takes without him there, I could take the best take, whether he was in there or not in there, Action. and I could take the best take of the other actors where they have the best performance, and then I could just erase Ahmed if I needed to, or he might not be in the shot at all anyway, and then I don't have to erase him. But now I can just erase him. I mean, the technology is such that I can just get rid of him. Pull the back and go! In spite of modern technology, more primitive techniques were used to get the right reactions from the actors as they travelled at light speed. I was amazed at how doing the battle sequences in a spaceship, I imagined they'd be all hydraulic and we'd be thrown around. And, but in actual fact, there's just someone in front of a light going like that, flagging the light off, and someone going, blast, and we'd pretend to be hit. I was so disappointed. <laughs> It was surprising to see all the backgrounds painted in so so realistically and so elaborately. It was really, really cool to see that because for us, we shot with a blue screen the whole time, which gives you the impression that it's not going to be too exciting. And then you see these amazing things and you see yourself in a place that you've never been, which is really bizarre. It was really cool, though. It is a great gift to see you alive, Your Majesty. <laughs> 